I was so scared and the only way they would take me from the border into the city was if I like hired a whole militia. They're all holding like machetes and guns and stuff. At one point, we kind of went off the plan. As we were right next to the stadium, a huge explosion happened. Well, our next guest is a true globetrotter. He has just completed- 193rd and final country. I'm Salavalo and I've been to every country in the world. Botswana, Canada, Uruguay, Netherlands, Djibouti, Hungary, Brunei, oh, Uganda, South Korea. We Swaziland. all go through this world in our own unique experience. So go out there and look for the new because that's what travel is about. Don't spend your time saving now because in a few years, you'll be able to save that much every week. I never kept track of money, but it was definitely not a trust fund. That's really good advice, actually, for younger people trying to find their career, their first job. It's just genuine excitement, not fangirling, and to... You're listening to the Eric Atavi podcast, the number one business podcast in the U.S., where we talk about entrepreneurship, money, and how to improve your life and achieve success. I'm your host, Erica Kohlberg. I'm a lawyer and personal finance expert with over 19 million followers on social media. Today, I'm interviewing Salvatore Lavallo, known by many as the youngest person to travel to every country in the world. While working and studying full-time, Sal had visited over 100 countries by the age of 24. So he put in his resignation and pursued traveling full-time, and he visited his final country, Malta, at age 27. As an expert traveler, Sal gives us advice on juggling work and travel, how to travel without spending all your money, and his top three travel tips you need to implement the next time you're planning a trip. If you're eager to learn how Sal was able to travel the world while still climbing the corporate ladder, you're in the right place. I'm Erica Kohlberg, this is Erica Taught Me, and today we're here with Salvatore Lavallo. When we first met, you were introduced to me as, this is Salvatore, he's been to every single country in the world. At a certain point, I'm sure you get sick of that introduction. How would you prefer people introduce you? What do you want to be known as? I have this theory about comma people where a lot of times we value people more on what comes after the comma. So it's like, I'm Salvatore Lavallo, comma, youngest person to visit every country. And people focus entirely on that, uh, whereas they forget about like who you are. And sometimes we even forget about who we are. No, I love that. And for context for people listening who don't know, can you talk about just kind of what you're doing right now in your role? Yeah, so I'm the head of foreign direct investment at the Abu Dhabi Investment Office. So we support companies that are expanding into the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. So we give like financial support um, to the companies that are expanding here, but also non-financial support to connect them with the government. It's exactly what I studied, which is yeah. thinking about how do you look at development in interesting ways and how do you help a country to develop? So what I would rather be introduced as, that's hard. I mean, I think it depends on the situation. Like if I'm with you, I just want to be, oh, this one of my friends, Salvatore. You know, if it's in a business context, you want them to understand why you're there. Your, your job title or something, but it does get a little bit uh, tiring because you know what the next 10 questions are after that. Like, did you really go to every country? What are your favorites? Have you been to my country? Like, what did you eat? You know, so then it's, it's less that I'm bothered by being introduced that way and more that I know what's going to be the next 10 minutes following, which is... Do people predictably ask the, like the same 10 questions? Yes. What are the ones you always get without fail? Favorite country and uh, wherever that person is from. What did you think about this play, like, you know, where I'm from. What did you think of Japan? I love Japan. <laughs> I, it's on, it was the first country I ever went to. Really? Yeah. When I was, so when I was growing up, my parents, we would do these road trips all around the States. And when I think we were, maybe I was like 10 or something, when we were old enough that they thought we would remember, they said, everybody, each kid pick an international trip and, and we'll, you will go on that one. And so I picked Japan. And then my father said, if we're going to go that far, let's also go to China. So I did a, three-week trip in 2004 with my father to Japan and China. What? And I loved it because after the Nagano Olympics in 1998, I was just like amazed by Japan. And I like even took like Japanese classes and stuff. I can't like say anything anymore, but I was just so, I just thought it was so different. And that's actually a big part of, of going to every country was the Olympics, specifically starting with the Nagano Olympics mm -hmm. and then seeing all the countries walk out. And then being just amazed by a place like Japan, which was so different. Um, and so, yeah, when I was 2004, I went to Japan, my first country outside the U.S. And then I didn't go back until 20, 2019. So 15 years difference. Right before the pandemic, right before it right closed before. up. 
and it was so much fun to uh i love japan i mean such amazing food fashion art uh nature is loved both my trip so there's some drama here because at, you were 27 year old years old you were the youngest person to do it i am yeah but if i google there are some other names that come up so <laughs> what happened so there's five or so people i think uh two girls and three guys who have gone to every country according to to guinness which they count layovers so the person who i think currently has the record was in North Korea for 10 seconds and never went to Syria. They just looked at it. And a lot of the others, there's one of the people who uh, actually gave like their travel information to um, kind of publicly. They were in 100 countries for less than a day. And so some of those 100 might have been a great visit, but a lot of them were just layovers. And so I don't count uh, a layover as a visit for myself within the travel community, which is a thing that exists, like yeah. the people who visit every country and there's like very kind of clear clubs, um, you know, a, a transit isn't counted. So the fact that Guinness, which is this kind of like obscure, I think like British or American, you know, a very Western thing gets to define it. Whereas this travel community, which is diverse and, uh, uh, you know, like our view of a visit doesn't count. Yeah. I find it kind of funky. But if they are just a record breaker and that's what they wanted to do and they played by the rules, then that's that's awesome for them. I mean, it's still an amazing thing that they did, uh, but I still consider myself the, the youngest to ever do it because I've been in every country. There's no country I feel like I didn't have a, a proper experience of. I have an average of like 10 days per country. You know, it's, yeah. it's very different, um, but, you know, no harm to, to those five. No, no harm. But I mean, a layover means they did not even leave the airport. The one that blows my mind is like just seeing the country and not actually being in it. Like just looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> that counts. Yeah, because basically, I guess what Guinness said is they want all their records to be breakable. And there was some situations where like with North Korea, Americans can't go into North Korea, same with Syria. And so they made exceptions. What was getting into North Korea like? For me, it was quite easy because back in the day, and even now, everybody other than Americans can just go. I think now during COVID, actually, they might be completely shut down still, but you used to just be able to book a tour and go. So I was there for a week in 2016 and I did four days on a private tour and then three days on a group tour. And I, I really enjoyed it because I actually studied North Korea like pretty in depth in university because I studied comparative economic development. And obviously North Korea has a very unique development story uh, and and strategy and path. And so I studied it quite a bit and I was told you're not going to learn that much by going because they're just going to basically read you a script and you already know the script because you've studied it. Mm -hmm. But actually when I went, I found it to be um, so much more beyond kind of the the, the shallow uh, guys that you're first shown. And I think that's the same for any country, right? Like you rarely go to, um, to the suburbs of any big city, right? Like when you say you've been to Paris, you're mostly probably within a few in a few specific areas yeah. um and so i like to take the socratic paradox like the wisest man knows that he knows nothing and turn it around and say the most traveled know that they've been nowhere and north korea is the best example of that because even though i could say i've been to north korea i know that i haven't seen everything there uh but then even in your hometown you can say you know have i done everything here have i had all the experiences of course not i want to take it back to when you were younger you had a very interesting schooling experience that i think led to you having, I don't know, 80 friends in 80 different countries that hosted you and made a lot of the travel possible? Yeah, so I went for to international boarding school called United World College. It's a, a movement of schools around the world. I think there's 18 now in 18 different countries. And the mission of United World College is to use education as a tool to unite, or sorry, it's to the, the mission don't uh, get it wrong yeah, exactly. <laughs> <They're listening. laughs> the, the mission of the uwc is to use education as a force to unite people nations and cultures for peace and a sustainable future so each school has around 200 to 300 students but they're from 70 to 90 different countries so in my two years there i met people from 
almost 100 countries. And then in my travels, I stayed with people from the school in, I think, yeah, 75 or 80 different countries. And it made the travel absolutely much more possible just because often, especially when I was younger, I would just book the ticket and then I'd stay with my friend's family. You know, and even now, whenever I'm traveling, I often will go see my friends from there and you get more of them like the local experience of it. So it made it possible entirely if I if I hadn't gone there. That was essentially the last two years of high school. And then did you take a gap year to travel or you went straight into college? I went straight into college. I went to NYU, New York, and I was there for, for two years. And then I took my entire junior year abroad. So I did four months in Tel Aviv and then um, and then I moved to Abu Dhabi. I thought I would be here for, for also four months. I've It's been 10 years since then and <laughs> I've stayed. I also took advantage of every break, like every spring break, every summer holiday, every winter break, I would travel somewhere. Um, I would often do it for work or for school. So like when I, when everybody else was interning down the street from the university, I would intern. I did internships in India. I mm. did, um, I started a, an NGO and we did projects around the world in Tanzania, in, in Venezuela, in the Caribbean, in St. Kitts. And so we, uh, like I took advantage of the kind of like tools that were at, in place, so like getting sponsored for research papers that I would write in these countries or um, and then also as just part of my degree because I was studying comparative development. You have to go to different countries to see how they're to compare. Yeah, exactly. To see how they're developing. And I always loved comparing. And so yeah. I wouldn't just go like I think actually it was like two years ago, only like right before COVID where I did my first trip where I went to only one country. Like I very rarely would just go somewhere and then like come straight back because if I go to um, uh, if I go to Japan, like my father said, let's go to China as well. Like if I go to Australia, I want to go to New Zealand, like kind of see the see those differences or see the similarities. And that that also kind of created fascination borders like we draw this line and then over here, it's a totally different currency, a different language like and yet like that might be more about the capitals, but the border. So I, I also traveled mostly by road because I love to cross borders. Yeah. Uh, so I've, I think I've done 115 countries now by, uh, by either land or sea border. So I pulled my audience and one of the questions I got most was how you could financially afford to travel to all of these countries. Were you, was it from your job or did you have a trust fund or what was it? So I don't entirely know. Like I don't have an, I, I know a lot about my travels. I have a very crazy Excel of like how many days in each place, how like when I went, all these things. I never kept track of money. Um, and that's an insanely privileged thing to say that like I went to every country, but I didn't really have to think about the money. But it was definitely not a, a trust fund. My parents, uh, except for the trip to Japan and China, my parents never paid for any other trip. Um, I would always like trap, but I didn't have to pay for my own university. I got most uh, like 60% covered in scholarship. My parents took care of the other part. Um, so whenever I'd be working in university, I'd use most of that to travel. I also got a lot of like research grants and different other support to, to travel um, in university. And then when I started working, I traveled a lot for work, um, which helped me get to a lot of countries. But then I also got a lot of points from uh, working and traveling so much. So that helped me travel cheaply um, and then because I was often staying with friends from school um, or work that helped the cost as well go down I don't consider myself like a budget traveler in any way or luxury traveler like I really depend sometimes I want a nice resort sometimes I don't but if I had to guess I would say that probably like fifteen hundred dollars per country is like mm -hmm. a good estimate of the cost if somebody would say I want to start now and do it with um, flights included yeah okay because I think you can combine a few, like do like land, you know, like Europe, you can just like go down the rail yeah. pass and stuff. But yeah, so I think it was just the answer for how I paid for it, all my own money that I made from working um, and then slowly but surely, you know, just over the course of 13 years. You know. Yeah. So at 27, when you completed the 193 countries, did you have much saved up or all of your savings to that point had gone towards travel? Yeah. So I didn't have a lot left over, like le I think only five figures at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've never really thought about, I don't know the way to put this, but I remember one time when I was young working at McKinsey as a consultant and I, somebody said, one of the, like the senior partners who's making you know, millions of dollars, uh, they said something which I think is really smart, but also incredibly privileged and that needs to be also considered. He said, don't spend your time saving too much now or don't affect your quality of life by saving now because in a few years you'll be able to save that much 
every week, right? So at the time, you know, like saving a thousand dollars a month would be kind of like crazy to think about, you know, when you're like younger. Mm -hmm. But then when you graduate, you start like working, maybe it's easy to save a thousand, but then maybe it's easy to save a thousand a week, you know? And so he, what he was saying is live your life like to the fullest. Don't worry too much uh, because in the future it'll be better. And that's maybe a gamble. You have to like assume that your life <laughs> is getting better. But I kind of like took that to heart. I never thought like, oh my God, I need to, I did have retirement savings that was automatically happening. But uh, I was, if I would have spent more while traveling, I would have been fine too, I think. At any point, I would just look at what was possible. I would think, how long do I want to stay somewhere? At what level of like luxury? Um, so I did say, you know, so while I was studying and working, I think it was just, I would travel enough and it was fine. When I just did the two and a half years of traveling full time, I had saved up to that point like enough and then just like would slowly like knock away at it. But I didn't get to the end. You know, I did you go straight into consulting for McKinsey right after you graduated from college? Yeah. So that was your first ever job. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd worked a lot in college. So I did. Um, I always worked when I was like 15. My father was like, now you're legally allowed to work. I'm going to stop paying for what you need and only pay for or sorry, I'm going to stop paying for what you want and only pay for what you need, which my sisters took as like a challenge. They were like, OK, like, and I thought I took it as like an insult. It's like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> you know, but I then I was a lifeguard for a few years at a pool. Um, I like worked in a restaurant, like in the restaurant at um, like in my neighborhood. And then I, then when I got to New York, I taught ESL, like English as a second yeah. language. I got certified when I was in, in boarding school. And then I taught that in, when I got older. And then I started working for the NBA in the, their NBA store, like, which used to be on Fifth Avenue. So I'm what? like, a, I didn't know this yeah, one. I'm a Fifth Avenue. I was employee of the month, November, 2009 of the NBA store on Fifth Avenue. So I'm like a, how did you achieve that? I, I like speak a little bit of a lot of languages and on Fifth Avenue, you have a lot of tourists and I'm also a bit talkative and I would, I did very well with the high net worth individuals who would come in and buy like the signed balls or the signed jerseys. And so when they would come in and it'd be a German person or a Spanish person or an Italian person and I could speak to them enough to, I could sell them the expensive stuff, you know, and so in their native tongue, in their native tongue. And, you know, it was a little bit of like a different experience. And, um, did you get a commission? I did get a commission when it was over like a certain amount. I would get a commission. Do you remember how much? I think it was like 15%. I think it was, That's it was impressive. good. Yeah. I like, it was nice. But then what was interesting is one day I, it was about to close. We were maybe like five minutes from closing and this older woman walks in and, I, and the store is huge. It's like two floors. I mean, it has like, a, it's enormous and there's so many products and I'm thinking she's not going to find what she wants in, uh, in five minutes. So I go up to her and I'm like the most, the kindest like gentleman you know i'm like you know calling her ma'am and you know asking her what she would like and and what she wanted was like down was really far away so like you wait here i'm gonna go run and get income but partly because to be nice but also because we're like closing yeah <laughs> and um and she was very very specific she was like you know i'm sending this as a gift to germany and so uh, it can't be wrong and i'm like oh like my my mother's german and i start speaking to her in german and i'm you know just being like the best salesperson and then as she's leaving she says if you ever want a job like a, or she, i think she actually said a little bit like like ruder she was like i don't think this is where you should be working like uh come see me and she gave me her card what? and me being like a, i was a freshman at the time so i was like uh, I was like, I have spring break next week, but I'll come, I'll come in two weeks if that's okay. And she's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so she like leaves and then I go to spring break. I come back and I just go to her office. I don't call. I don't make an appointment. Like I didn't know what I was doing. So I just go to her office and I remember going downstairs at security. This is like in Midtown, like this huge bank building. They're like, is she expecting you? I'm like, yeah, she told me to come. And they're like, but do you have a meeting? And I'm just like, no. <laughs> so they let me up. And she's like shocked. She's like, I, I remember you, but I had no thought that you would come here. And she was like, well, the only the positions we have are you're required to be a German citizen and have a master's degree from Germany. And I was like, well, I'm my mom's German and I'm, so I'm German, um, you know, but I'm a freshman in college. And she's like, all right, I'll give I'll let you like shadow us for like three weeks. And I ended up working there for almost three years in the investment promotion agency of the German government you know, so bringing American investment to Germany and which is interesting, really kind of the job I do now for the Abu Dhabi government. Um, and I worked there almost all of college. Like it, you know, I was studying economic development and to be working for the Department of Economic Development for German, the German government at the time. And then uh, I actually a couple of years ago, I had to go on a delegation with a minister from the UAE 
to Germany. And we went to the headquarters of the entity, the department that I was working for in Germany. And I, when I told them that there, they were, I mean, they were just so surprised. Like, <laughs> I used to intern for you guys in your New York office and all because you did something good selling her whatever she wanted to buy at that time. Yeah. It's like a very New York thing. I think like, I, like I would do that a lot. I would just, another time I got a um, job in New York to be a manny, a male nanny. Mm -hmm. Cause I decided at this point, I was either going to get a job that would look really good on my resume or pay me a lot, like one or the other, because usually they're inverse. You know, And the so, manny paid you a lot. And right? the manny paid me a lot. So I went there and it was really fun, amazing couple in the West Village. And I would basically go and sit on their couch and like watch TV. They'd give me like $20 for delivery. Like you used to have to like call, you know, like you <laughs> didn't have like an app or anything. Call and I'd, you know, I'd only spend $10 and then I'd keep the extra 10 and, um, and I felt bad though, because I was doing like nothing. I was literally being paid to like watch TV. They have a kid, I assume. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there, there was a child. <laughs> and they, uh, so I started being like, you know, is there anything else I can do? Like, I'm very organized. I can organize your stuff or, you know, and I kept saying, is there anything I can help you with? And finally, one day they were like, you know, we are thinking about buying an olive orchard. Uh, we don't know where, we don't know exactly what that means, um, but can you help us? And I literally the next day, I stayed up the entire night put together this presentation of like where the different types of olive orchards are, what it would entail to buy one, to own one, et cetera. That same day, he said, you're no, the father said, you're no longer the Manny. Like you're now my investment assistant on this specific project. What? So like what you presented me was better than what the consultants we had hired had shown me. And so for the next few months, that's what I did is I worked. And then I tra I was 19, I think. And I traveled to Argentina uh, to shop around different olive orchards on behalf of this family. You know, again, it was just I started as a Manny. What? But then I, <laughs> and so then uh, you know how to work your way up very quickly. Well, I mean, it was I, they ended up not buying it. They were supposed to come on the trips and somebody got sick. It was like a whole thing. But yeah, I'm like just like these weird experiences. Like even here, when I first came to Abu Dhabi, it, to work, I somebody asked me, what do you want to do? And at that time, I, I said I wanted to be in consulting because I had found online, I think I was searching economic development jobs. And some there's this firm that said, like, we solve the world's biggest problems. And I was like, I want to do that. And it was like a development focused consulting firm called Dalberg, who still do amazing work. And I was a freshman and I emailed every like week or something, the different people in the New York office saying, can I just shadow you? And they're like, we only hire people like graduates from Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. You Sorry, are, NYU. Yeah, you're like a freshman. Like, you know, it's like you're not a graduate. I'm like, let me just shadow. Let me do anything. They're like, no. And I even had like my scholarship would pay. Like they didn't have to pay me. I would get paid by the scholarship. Then they had a Nairobi office and I was doing a project in Tanzania. So I emailed the head of their Nairobi office saying, can I, can I please work for you part of the summer while I'm in Tanzania doing this other thing? They're, and they were like, absolutely not. Um, you know, I was a sophomore. This was one year later. But they said, we'll let you meet a team. So they had a a team that was working in Tanzania come and have lunch with me. Yeah. And I was just like, this is so amazing. And then I found out that the head of all of their Asia projects had gone to my boarding school. So I'm like, this is an easy one to bug and he has to respond. So I bugged him and okay, please intern, whatever. So we find, so that we we're going to do like a winter internship, but it ended up being like some, so I ended up like going to India, working for this company that I had been thinking about for years. At the end of it, they said, we're, we're still a pretty small company. You know, you can come back here and work if you want in India, but um, we think you should get trained at one of the bigger consulting firms. So uh, I had done an internship as well with Booz Allen Hamilton while in Abu Dhabi. So I'd done a little bit of consulting. And then I, um, so I thought about, okay, I had offers from Dalberg and Booz Allen Hamilton. Where would I take instead? And then the only one I was interested in really was McKinsey. So I applied to McKinsey and then I worked for them for, for three years and that's kind of how I got into consulting was bugging every single person at multiple different offices <laughs> of Dalberg until they let me meet them and then work for them. I mean, when I was living in India working for them, I was making $500 a month and my rent was like $600. That was horrible. That wow. was like a, but I wanted to do it so badly and I knew it would like help me in the future. I just like used money I'd saved up before and tried not to eat very much. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. So McKinsey, though, you ended up taking their full-time offer. How much did they pay you? At the This was 2013. They were paying associates $68,000. Sorry, uh, analysts $68,000 a year in the UAE office. And was it a step program where every year they'd promote you slightly and you'd make slightly yeah, more? Yeah, you'd get like a little bonus I based on your performance. I thought they made more. I felt like McKinsey was like now, okay to start, right? No, now it's 80, I think. Mm. Um and it's the, I think the UAE's the the three highest the four highest paid offices are are 
I think it's New York, Tokyo, and the UAE. Um, but you don't get the tax as much here, obviously. But they, um, yeah, now it's 80. But you get like a little bit of bonus or whatever at the end. And you get, you, you also get like obviously the retirement stuff. And you get, I got a little bit of a housing allowance because I was living in Abu Dhabi, which is more expensive than Dubai. And that, or was more expensive than Dubai. I think it still maybe is. And then, and then I think it, your third year, you would make more. Maybe your, our third year, we made 80 or something. Were you still called an analyst or at that point you, yeah. you're given a new title? Called an analyst, but it was different offices have different stuff. Back then it was like very much like a three-year program in the UAE, but in New York and stuff, they would, because you put a lot of money into training these people. And so there used to be this like up and out policy where very few people would be go from analysts to being associates. And then they realized we're, we're training these people these people so much like maybe we should keep more of them so there it i was kind of at the cusp of when they started changing that yeah. and a lot more people could could stay and then like my group of four friends one of them left to basically be like an entrepreneur two of them left to go to harvard business school and then i left to travel <laughs> travel the world <laughs> you were probably the most interesting by far they're all actually two of them came to my finale party to my last country in malta mm -hmm. And um, I was sponsored at the time by Marriott and they sent a film crew to film my finale. And the guy who I'd been talking, like liaising with a lot, um, he said, I was really excited to meet you in person, but I didn't realize how cool all your friends would be. You know, because I had these <laughs> like really awesome friends coming with me. And I was like, yeah, of course, like I'm around way more impressive people than I am. Uh, so you were getting sponsored. The, I didn't realize this. Yeah, so at the end. You were on social media. They found you. Marriott was an interesting story because as a consultant, we used, we were obsessed with, at the time it was SPG, which like merged in like 2017, I guess, with Marriott. Mm -hmm. So we were all like SPG obsessed. We, somebody actually calculated at one point that as an analyst, it was something like a 10% bonus to your salary because the partners. Just from the points that you're yeah. getting from traveling with SPG. Yeah. Because you stay at the same, you know, the analyst who's 22 gets the same hotel room as the partner who's 52. And so the and you get the same amount of points. Mm. So for the analyst, it's a huge benefit to have all these points on your credit card and, you know, to, to stay. And so one of my friends was working at Marriott and they had already heard, you know, they're like, this guy's already obsessed with Marriott, has been using it all the time. You know, why don't we continue? Like I was already mentioning them in interviews. So they're yeah. like, maybe we uh, we sponsor him to do a little bit more travel and to, uh, you know, mention Marriott more. I, I would say they helped me do it in a nicer way, but I, I would have done it yeah. anyway. It was just, I got to stay at some nicer hotels for the last six months. So the last six months or so, SPG helped you by giving you these points. But I also want to know how logistically it all happened. How do you plan going to 193 countries? Are you trying to group them all together or how does that work? I wish I did. So as you said at the beginning, like I wasn't planning to go to everyone. So until those last six months, I wasn't thinking, oh, I have to get to all of them. So I would just go where I wanted to go. But I've been to every continent other than um, Oceania 20 times or more because I would normally just go and go to one country or two countries and come back. That's not efficient. That's not efficient. Like the way I did it is not the way anybody should should do it. I logistically, it's insane. Right, just to like to think about how to go. What has helped is being in Abu Dhabi, which is so well located, mm -hmm. and to use this as my base because I could be at home and then do a three day weekend and create like the amount of the three day weekends in in the Comoros, three day weekends in all of the different stands. You know, like that was a big part of just like being able to jump off from here. Visas were incredibly hard to plan because some visas you have to be in your country of of origin in order to get the visa. Some you can get in the neighboring country. Some are incredibly difficult to get, and I had to call friends and get favors and find businesses to help me and do all these crazy things to get visas. What was the most difficult? The get? most difficult was probably Libya. I did Libya, Yemen, and Syria, and Afghanistan all in 2017. Mm. So probably the most dangerous time to travel of any time was probably 2016, 2017. That's when a lot of the uh, like Islamic State, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, um, there's also different diseases were happening. That's probably when there's the most like varied terrorism attacks around the world happening. So figuring out where to go and stay safe, 
and where how to get in and it was it was very hard and it takes a lot of planning and flights and like do you have the visa of the place where the flight is connecting and luckily i have an american passport and i'm living in abu dhabi so it was easy to to like jump off from here and figure it out but yeah, libya was really hard because i went in 2017 americans couldn't go so i had to get i had to have a libyan friend who i used to work with his like cousin got me a business visa but then it kept delaying so i went to algeria i thought i was going to stay there for six days i ended up staying for a whole month just waiting, waiting for the libyan visa luckily i found these amazing friends who i'm still friends with i ended up moving from the hotel into their house uh, i love algeria but there was a lot of points where i said maybe i'm not going to be able to do this and you know because i it, syria was also americans weren't allowed to go to syria they still aren't really um so i had to like find a friend who communicated with the government told them why i wanted to go um got an exemption so i actually went you know, online, so. <laughs> those countries where it's harder to get into, does it make it so much more worth it when you're there? Like you have to appreciate every single minute more. There's this like incredibly special feeling of like landing in a new country that I don't really get. I like I can go to a new city, but there was something about knowing that the number was going higher, that I was getting closer. So yeah, the ones that were hard when I finally would get in, um, but a lot of the hard ones were dangerous. So it's also about, thank God I got out, you know, mm. so after a few days, I need to also get out of the country. And so what was the most dangerous situation you feel like you've been in? I never think it's fun to like be unsafe. So I would always try and look for the safest way to to get anywhere. And I was in one country that was like in war at the time, but I was in the capital. So there wasn't um, too much happening. And I was lucky because one of my friends family was in the government. And so they gave me the, the government official like armored vehicles and the um, the soldiers and stuff that were protecting us. And I remember saying like, is this protecting us or bringing more attention to us? And they said, it's the soldiers aren't protecting you. It's this. And they held up the radio and they're like, we tell them everywhere that we're going. And they say if it's okay or if it's not, or you know, like what's happening, they're listening in on whatever. But at one point we kind of went off the plan because we heard that there was like a sports match like a happening at the stadium. I was like, that would be so cool to go see like a, see this game. And so as we were driving, as we were, sorry, it's like hard to, I've never told this story. And I, the, it's because I don't like telling these stories because it's hard to remember because it's scary. Yeah. But so we were driving to, uh, and even my mother doesn't know this. So when she listens to this, she's going to be very upset at me. Oh my gosh, as sorry, we were mom. driving, we were probably like 50 meters away. So we had to, the stadium was to our side. I was like sitting like this stadium was to the right. And so we had to, I could see it, but we had to loop around. And as we were right next to the stadium, a huge explosion happened. And there was a suicide bomber who had gone in the queue. And right when he got to the front of security, like they started to pat him down. They saw the vest or whatever, and he blew up. <gasps> so he killed like all the people around him and the security guards all around him. And, you know, we were right, like we were about to go, like if there had been better traffic or like, who knows, right? But like, that's where we were going. And of course, immediately the sirens go on, like the, they start, because I was with all the military, you know, so thanks be to God. I mean, but then what I found fascinating about this and the other experiences where I've like been in danger of some kind is once it blew up and we started leaving, I was kind of like, it was scary when the bomb happened, but then you're kind of like, okay, it's over, right? Like fear tends to lack to be really quick, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the guy who was with me, the guide, he was like almost in shock. And it's because he started being like, you know, this is where my children live. And like he it like that bomb represented a lot more to him than just like that one bombing happening. But for me, I was kind of like, OK, like we're fine. Like we're safe. Like I like went on with the day. I wonder if that was your coping mechanism. Yeah, though. I think like so. I bet you were in shock. Yeah, I think it was just like you. Do, it's like a you don't expect it to to happen. And I think also I had another another time, like a, a separate like but similar version where and I, where I was um, in between Burkina Faso and Niger, which is a very at the time very dangerous and still is actually um, a lot of Akam forces are there in this specific road. And I was so scared and they, the only way they would take me from the border into the city was if I like hired a whole militia to like keep me safe. But it's like when you're, so I was in this little car and they wanted me to be in the middle so nobody could see through the windows that like there's a white guy in there. Mm -hmm. And, but they're all holding like machetes and guns and stuff. And I'm like, are they protecting me? Or like, I don't, like I don't speak their language. Like I, like I was told that these guys are going to protect me and take me, but I didn't know. So I was like praying and I was like kind of just sitting there like, just, I want this to be over. I want this to be over. And I remember we were, 
um, we stopped at one point and I looked up and this is like in the middle of nowhere in the Sahel and I've never seen so many stars. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. So there's absolutely zero light pollution. And it was like maybe like 10 seconds of being like, wow, that's beautiful. And then I was like afraid again. And then when we arrived into the city and they were like, you know, thank you so much or like whatever, I realized I had just spent the last like six hours being afraid and nothing happened. Yeah. You know, and so it's kind of like fear is you should you should take as much um, caution as you can to be safe. But when something happens, it's usually quick. You know, like you, you end up spending more negative energy around fear than you do actually being afraid of something happening. And so I think that was a good lesson of like how to keep like a positive attitude while traveling. But yeah, it's like really scary. Like I can still picture the the bomb. Did you feel it in any way? Did the car shift at all or? I don't know if it was like the car, like me physically moving, you know, but uh, and it was just like this. And obviously all the cars stopped. I mean, it was it was just a lot really fast. You know, like the bomb happened. Everybody stopped. And even um, it's such a surreal thing that I remember a few times even like a couple months ago, I remember I like Googled like the time, like, you know, the location and the date and like suicide bombing just to be like, that did happen, you know, like, and it, it did <laughs> like it was, but I think it's just that it seems so surreal that I was like, that can't, I don't know. It's, uh, but that didn't change you, your plans or anything at all. Like, I feel like I might've gotten shaken and wanting to go home. Yeah, I know. I think I, um, yeah, it did. I think I realized that I wasn't going to think about it very much. I wasn't going to, I think I knew immediately then that I wasn't going to ever tell anybody until I was on Erica's, Erica's uh, fine print podcast. But the, uh, <laughs> I remember, because that's when I was most active on like Instagram and stuff. And I remember being, I'm absolutely not going to post this. And the reason why, and I, because at the time my tagline was, promoting the beauty and positivity of the the little known or negatively perceived countries because I wanted to only show places that either you've never heard of or you've only heard bad things about yeah. and where this happened was a place that if I would say to people oh this happened to me here they'd be like oh of course yeah. you know but actually like the times where I've felt in most danger tend to be like in cities in the western countries like in Philadelphia or like you know in London and so I'd rather when I'm in a country that is war torn, I'd rather show like the beauty of the people or the food or something because that trip, for example, I had the some of the best food of my life. I was hosted by like a friend's family, like very, very kindly. Like I went on this gorgeous tour of like the nature and every, I mean, it was just such a great visit. Mm -hmm. And that like five minutes of negativity, like is, and I've told stories of that trip many, many times, but never that five minutes because it seems like the least relevant five minutes of the trip. I think that's very admirable what you're doing where, I've listened to so many podcasts that you've been on and you've never once said a bad thing about a country. And I do like that approach. That five minutes was an isolated incident and you don't want it. If you say, if that's why we're not going to reveal that country name because if you reveal that, it taints a lot of people's perception of that country. Yeah, and it's like you, even as humans, it's the same with the way that, say it's like you need 10 compliments to make up for one insult. You know, like you'll go, like you'll cut your hair and you'll have everybody love it, but one person. And then you're just like, God, like that one person said it, you know, and then you're just, and I think it's the, sometimes the same in travel people, I think people also expect ne negative experiences mm -hmm. to happen. And so many people in the world are, are good. I remember once I was uh, at a border, I was robbed. They took all the money that I had. And so I kind of was stuck, but then somebody bought me my bus ticket some when we stopped somewhere, somebody got me tea. And then when we arrived, somebody got me taxi to a hotel. And so I remember I wrote that um, that night a post where I said, thank you to the person who bought me this and to the person who got me this and the person who got me this. Um, and I hope whoever like took my money uh, like that, you do good with it or something. Because I was like, you know what? I can focus on this one bad person or I can be like, wow, these three other people helped me. And I think too often we're like, we think about the story that will stick more. And uh, but then you're just being regular and who wants to be regular? Where should we go? anywhere i think we should go like fun places around like here that you wouldn't think to go to like the stands maybe somewhere you can come to my farm in tanzania if you were able to uh oh we need to talk about your farm yeah so tan one of the, like so abu dhabi's home america's home but also tanzania is like kind of my like special place i when i used to run an ngo in university the first project we did was in tanzania in this small village and what's funny is we were actually supposed to be in another village in like a month before like hey do you mind if we shift and I was like, oh, that's totally fine. Like, you know, completely random. And I just like fell in love with this place and the people. And it was such a different world at the time. It's all, it still is all dirt roads, but there was 
no real electricity, no like cellular network or anything. I mean, it was just so remote and separate. And I felt like there the people cared about like if you were nice or if you were not nice. Like that's how they decided if they if they liked you or not. And I remember that at that time is when I was trying to get that um, that meeting with that consulting team. Mm-hmm. And I remember email and I had to like, you know, sell myself. I had to say, you should meet with me because I'm this, 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 and this. And then in the village, they were just like, if you're smile, we're nice. If you're, you know, and I loved that. And so I've gone back every single year since then. I now own a couple of farms there. So I give all of my my zakat, like the Islamic charity, every year to Tanzania, to the people there. And so with that, they've used the to um, buy a couple of farms. We have a bicycle shop. We have like a clothing shop. We're building, um, it's like a soda shop. So we're doing, uh, there's lots of different businesses and like my friends that I've supported there. And I love going every year because it's it's such a different world. And I remember last time I went, um, it was right after COVID in like January 2021. And my uh, one of the girls that I work with, she's like, oh, it was really funny when you're posting from Tanzania. And I was like, what, what do you mean? She's like, oh, you know, like you were like cooking on the ground and like there wasn't um, AC and, you know, it's not you. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, like that's where I feel the most me. Like that's my... And she's like, well, kind of like a little bit of a princess, aren't you? Like, you know, you like fancy things. I'm like, what? I'm like, no, I don't. And she's like, eh, like, and then I was like, oh, it's so interesting that like I'm super comfortable in like, you know, high end like luxury in the in the UAE. Um, but also I love going, spending 10 days or even like I used to go for a month at a time when I didn't have a job, like staying in the village, no electricity, just being kind of like relaxed and that kind of like dichotomy is fascinating, I think, too. Like, yeah, that I can be so happy and so at home in, in both of those situations. But the fact that you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's like, so for those last 40 countries where you had quit your job to go full time travel, did you not plan all 40 at a time? You just did like one or two? Absolutely not. My last four countries were on four different continents. Like I was so like when I tell you that I it was not efficient the way that I did it, it was not efficient. So people should not be listening to you for advice on how to plan 193 I can countries. like plan a great trip for you. And I like I learned a lot, but I think it's because what's fun is to see places at different times. So if you're trying to go to every country and you go to all of South America in one year and you're like, oh, I've been to South America. It's like, well, you, you've you been to every country in South America in 2020. Yeah. That's not the same as in 2030 or, you know, 2010. And so I love to see that like time difference. You know, like I said, Japan, like t- 2004 until 2019 like what a crazy difference in China even more so I went back 12 years later 2016 and so that's and when people say like is there any country you don't want to go to I always say no I would go back to every country and they think that's a, a annoying answer but it's because I change the country change changes and the people that I'm travel with also change what about travel advice then what I'd say the, the number one thing, which is more of like a mindset, is decide what you like and do that. So when I travel to a new country, I always look up the best food, the best tea place, the best ice cream, the best art gallery. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to, you know, try the local food and like meet people. But I have friends who they always, oh, and I love to see sporting events. I always see if there's a sporting event or like an opera or like some kind of like event going on. And that's what I will do while I'm there. Um, but different people have different things. Maybe they want to um, like only see art or they only want to eat or they only want to do adventure stuff. And so I think it's just about make each trip like your own trip. Like don't think that there's one itinerary for going to Kyrgyzstan. You know, yeah. you can do, you can have like a very personal trip there. The second thing I would say is you should probably book earlier you know, <laughs> and like do do a little bit of research, but not too much because the most fun part of traveling is those surprises. So if you have like all of this like scheduled and if you know what you're going to see and you've like watched a hundred YouTube videos about the place you're going to go, you'll you'll have a lot of preconceived notions and yeah. preconceived ideas of what you're going to see and then you don't get like the fun excitement which is what travel is. We don't like travel because we like to get on planes and like you know be uncomfortable for 10 hours. We like travel because we like to to explore the foreign to like learn new things and so find the things that you're excited about learning about and like make your trip about that. I'd also say don't think too much about like your comfort zone or like lack thereof. I think people feel like they have to be uncomfortable when they're traveling, but you definitely don't. I mean, you can, um, you know, push the boundaries of it, but don't go outside of it if it's something that will like ruin your your trip. On like money, I think you should like never, you should try not to, like traveling doesn't have to be stressful financially as long as you're thinking about, okay, like look at the budget that you have, whatever makes you feel comfortable to spend on it. And then think about how far do you want to go for how long and at what level of luxury and decide which of those is the most important to you. 
Like if you want to do a very luxurious trip, but you only have a thousand dollars and maybe you do a very luxurious weekend somewhere, mm -hmm. right? If you are fine to be budget, you know, and you want to travel for like six months, you know, then that will tell you, okay, you can travel in maybe Southeast Asia or in like Latin America, but there's other places that you're probably not going to be able to get to on 50 or a hundred dollars a day. And then others that, you know, yeah. you probably won't be able to, um, Uh, be very comfortable no matter what you spend. And so I think it's about realizing, okay, what are your priorities? What are like you willing to go? And then, and then kind of like really assessing that. So when someone says, where should I go? My first one was like, well, where do you want to go? And what kind of trip are you trying to get out of it? You know, there's a lot more questions that are, are needed. Um, and I feel like I've become a much better traveler since I finished every country because I've been able to do the trips that I want to do yeah, and to do what I want to do in each place because I don't feel stressed because I, I know that I'll go back. For example, Japan, again, when I was there, I had booked all these like nice Marriott hotels. And then my first day in Tokyo, I realized I don't want to be in the hotel at all. And I was kind of uncomfortable with how much like the Tokyo hotels are pretty expensive. And so I was kind of like, you know, if I'm paying $300, $400, I'd probably want to like, maybe I should do dinner at the hotel or, you know, but then I was like, actually, and I ended up canceling all the other reservations. And um, I even stayed in like a capsule hotel one night because I was like, this is a fun experience. And I ended up spending most of my money on tea experiences. So I like Googled the these and they have incredible tea experience they have like really traditional ones but also really modern ones um a lot more i bought a lot of like fashion like a lot of um shoes but also a lot of like japanese like fat and and then i was like you know what because i don't really care so much about the hotel on this kind of trip whereas if i'm going on a resort i'm like gonna look only at yeah the hotel and so i think i've become such a better traveler because in each situation i'm thinking you know what do i want to uh get out of this trip um but yeah i think a lot of times in in any travel thing people are like oh like we have to have the, like they think very much of what they're like supposed to do and not like what they they want and that tends to like essentialize culture right because we think of we tend to think of culture as this like static thing and it's so dynamic i always use actually japanese culture as an example because all these tourists will go to tokyo and dress up as a geisha and walk through harajuku and they think like oh this is like the japanese traditional outfit but it's like a Japanese traditional outfit. There's like dozens more, but this is the one that like white people will come and pay for, you know? That's and true. so then this becomes this idea, like you're perpetuating this idea of what culture is based on what other people are paying for. And there's some countries like Japan, which has done an incredible job of like keeping like domestic culture and like internal culture. But there's other ones where everything is based off of what a tourist will pay for. And then people talk about like authentic experiences. I hate the word authentic because when you're The search for authenticity is really like an excess, like it's a essentializing search. You're trying to be like, this is what it is like, or this is who I am. And we talk about like finding your authentic self as if you now are the exact same as 10 years ago. Like we're completely changing, like who you, who your true self is, is yeah. based off of so much. So in travel, when people are like, oh, I want like an authentic cultural experience. It's like, well, and they'll say, oh, well, you know, and you traveled in a, in a fancy way and that's not authentic. Well, that is a type of authentic experience there you can also do and doing the low end one is also an authentic type and and maybe even doing like in a way cities that are becoming super touristy that becomes the culture in itself you know like i was just in venice like a gondola ride did they used to do that like a normal person yeah it was like a way to get around does any like local venetian now take gondolas like no is it purely a tourist thing like yes it does that still mean it's part of the culture like yeah but if you say oh i'm doing this because that's what they used to do it's kind of silly you're doing this because yeah that's what everybody does now <laughs> and i that balance i think can be hard especially when you're trying to share your trips with others because you end up often like in a weird murky area yeah now that you're not spending all of your money on travel Where does your money go? When I stopped traveling at first, I got a, I was really lucky. I was able to do a lot of uh, like sponsored trips for a couple of years. Like I did a lot of, so I wasn't paying for travel at all. And so first I got addicted to shoes. I bought a <laughs> lot of shoes in 2018. And then I uh, started collecting watches. I really love world timers, which is a specific complication that like shows you different cities around the world. So it kind of connects me back to the travel stuff. Yeah. And so I'm always like looking for new world timers and uh, and some other different types of watches. But uh, and then a lot of art, 
I buy a lot of art. Like you've seen my I know home. your house is beautiful. It's like a museum. I love it just makes me happy. Like and it's funny because for someone who for two and a half years didn't have a home to now have like kind of a pretty big aesthetic focus on my home. It's like interesting. Are you thinking of those as investments or? Yeah, I think some of them. I mean, like what with art collecting and kind of the same with like watch collecting. I say that you need to follow the three P's, which is you have to love price, the piece and the portfolio. So the price you have to love because it needs to be something that you feel like uh, either can like return you money or that you don't care that it won't return you money, right? Like you need to be okay with it and not look at it as, oh, this costs this much. Mm -hmm. You have to love the piece because you're going to live with it. It has to be in your house. You know, you have to think it's beautiful, but you also have to love the portfolio because that's also where a lot of the value comes in. You know, if you see one beautiful piece, but then you see the other works that the artist has done and it's kind of mediocre, then you know, you're, you're buying a part of that, that artist portfolio. And so having one piece, usually it's about not only the actual piece, but what it represents. And when other people, you know, will like see your collection and they'll be like, oh, I have another one from, you know, like you, in a way it's, um, it's very much what NFTs are like looking at now. Like you become yeah. a part of a community, like you're somebody who has this artist. And so you want to find ones that have that community around them that like other like collectors have. And so that's always been like my focus in art, but it's, it's always about like loving each individual thing getting it for a good price and then um like collecting specific artists that i like enjoy my relationship with them or the story that their portfolio kind of tells you know what's funny is for art investing it's actually very hard to break into and to befriend the right artists but i was thinking of all of your stories how you you basically hustled your way into these different positions you're essentially applying that to the art world now I think it's, yeah, I guess. <laughs> right? I, like, did you ever think of it like that? I guess it's, you know, I think looking back on it, it's easy to think of it as like, as hustling or like the way I tell the stories. But I shouldn't, networking. You were an expert well, networker. Yeah, Let's ne say that. Instead and I think, yeah, exactly. So when I've been told that before, like, oh, you're so great at, at networking, whether it's for work or in the travel or whatever. But I think it's actually comes, it starts with a genuine curiosity. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't go up and talk to someone that I don't want to talk to. You know, so like when I'm networking, it's because I'm like, I'm actually interested in that person. Yeah. Um, I also think there's like a confidence in it, like thinking that it, it goes both ways. Like if you are like fangirling over somebody, they don't see any value in, in you. Right. And so if you're going for like a specific reason, like business or like what, like they need to get a value from you as well. It can't be one sided. And I think that's kind of where it's, it's come from. It's like, if you're genuinely interested, that's how it should always be. Right. Because you should only be working in stuff that you're excited about. Yeah. And so you should be genuinely excited to meet someone who's like the boss of the business that you want to get into because they're the boss of, of that business. But you also have to like have that confidence to be like, I'm like relevant to this at the same time. That's that really good advice actually for younger people who are getting started off trying to find their career, their first job. It's just genuine excitement, not fangirling, passion about something and, and confident being confident that you're bringing something to in it. There. To be like, because even like all contracts are, like we tend to like say thank you when someone gives us a job. We're like, oh my God, like thank you. So, but actually it's like, they're they're getting more out of it than what they're giving you always or else they wouldn't structure it that way you know that's like, true we should say you're welcome yeah you, you're welcome when you like, say yes to the job you're welcome yeah you're welcome that i'm gonna come and work for you <laughs> like i mean i think it's that's how like we have to have that kind of uh conference but also i think the the best thing when you're young is like a and with actually with anything it's like a humility to like learn and like a, a to be very aware of of knowing that there are more things that you don't know you don't know then there are things that you know or things that you know you don't know which might sound a little like calm, but it's like from that Pocahontas song, like learn the things you never knew you never knew. If you show that you're willing to learn and that you are okay to say what you don't know, then I think that goes really, really it far. It does. I'm hesitant when people meet you to be like, this is Sal. He's been to all 193 countries because I know in some ways you feel pigeonholed into it. Almost it's like a, I don't know how you would describe it. It's like a, a party trick. I think you it's become the party trick. Yeah, I think it also is something from like five years ago. Like if I was actively traveling, it would be a huge part of my identity. It was then. Yeah. And now that it's, I'm very rarely in a situation where that's the most relevant part. You know, like often now, like I get introduced by like my title at work and that tends to be like more and that's like fine. Like that's relevant in the situation. But I feel like when you're when you're introducing somebody like with like the what's after the comma, you're trying to say, this is how we give this person value. 
Like this is what's cool about them. I've also seen this a lot with um, celebrities that I've like done business with who are still known now for something they did 10 or 20 years ago. And that's like so not the focus of their life anymore. And it's it's kind of like sad to see that like pigeonholed in that that kind of way. I think what I would like to be thought of now is like someone who has worked in economic development in very like different ways. Because I feel like that's like what the path has been like from the boarding school to the university, to the travel, to my professional, like it's all been based around one understanding that development is not just increasing economic indicators, but it's increasing quality of life. And we all define that in different ways. And if I can be like part of getting that to be the understanding, whether it's from the investing that I do now or the people I talk to or like the stories that I tell, that would be like what I what I want, because that's kind of what all the different things have always been connected to is that improving our life isn't only like economic and we have in different ways. And I think that's what I would like to be yeah. focused on. Took me a while to get there. So I have some fun questions from the audience, actually. We're going to do like a rapid fire. OK, round, I love okay? it. Where's the best pizza? Either New York or Napoli. What if you had to pick one? Uh, New York. How many years did it take to travel to every country? 13. What's your favorite credit card? Chase Sapphire Reserve. Are you really the youngest person to travel to every country? Yes. Because why? Because I actually went to every country. I did not <laughs> transit or look at countries or stay for only 10 seconds. Lovely. What is one thing you do in every country? Dance. What kind of dancing? Any, whatever the, the, the dance is. I love dancing. And I oh, think, yeah? Yeah. I used to be like a big dance, like, a, like a, I'd get paid to dance and stuff. And, and I, yeah, everybody dances. And I think it's, uh, I love to like see the, the new kinds of dance. Did all of that travel make the world smaller or bigger to you? I think smaller in terms of accessible. Like I feel like the world is accessible and bigger because you just realize there are 7 billion people who are all living 24 hours a day. And just the, the sum of all that experience is, is literally unfathomable. Yeah. Where do you call home? Abu Dhabi, Tanzania, and New York. Do you feel like having a life partner is important? Yes. So if you know anybody, anybody, all the cameras. Are you single? I'm, I'm single. I'm looking uh, for a <laughs> life partner. Perfect. You got that, everyone. So hit me up. Maybe that can be the next podcast. We'll do like a dating show. Have yes. everyone lined up for you. Yes. Like just, well, I feel like I'd have to line up for them. I, like, <laughs> you know, I'll just see who your guests are. Cause I'm, you know, I want to, I love like a really, like a powerful, like amazing woman. Like I, I get really excited when they're. We're going to have lots of powerful women on the podcast. Exactly. That's what I need. Where was the best meal you'd had while traveling? Uh, probably Japan. A few times. Like the, yeah. Are you just saying that because no, it's me? No, I love Japanese. Japan and Afghanistan. Amazing food. And Italy. I love, yeah. I have a lot. I eat, love eating. So <laughs> Japan, Afghanistan, Italy, some of the best food. Okay. Let's leave it with top five countries to visit. If you could visit only five countries, I would say the UAE, for sure. Most diverse country people from all over uh tanzania uh algeria probably the united states and japan okay sweet Yay! Yay! thank you i hope you enjoyed today's episode i'll link sal's instagram in the show notes so be sure to go check it out and also it would mean a lot if you could take just a moment to leave a review for the podcast it really helps support the work that we're doing Thank you for spending your time with me today, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.